Bismillah. First of all, let's let's get to know each other. Um, where's everyone from? Where's everyone from? Um, I'm in Sweden. Is there anyone actually from Sweden? No, I don't mean born in Sweden, but their heritage is Swedish. Like, was it blonde hair, blue eyes, Swedish? Who's from Sweden in there? Any hands in the air? Woo! Yeah, one, two, woo! Yeah, couple. Woo, woo! <laughs> Have we got anyone from uh, Eritrea? And the Eritrea, woo, woo, quite a few Eritreans in there. Have we got anyone from, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see, Nigeria. Nigeria. Woo, one, two, Somalia, Somalia. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, 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 okay. Anyone been to England, London? Yeah, that's where I'm from. I'm born and raised in South London, an area called Brixton. Yeah. I, when I was born, I wasn't given this name Muslim Bilal. I didn't come out in the, in the hospital. My mum was like, mm, I'm thinking Muslim. And my dad was like, no, I'm thinking Bilal. Which name should we give him? Nah. I weren't given that name at birth. I was raised as a Christian. Both my parents are from Jamaica. My dad's mixed with Chinese. Um... And I used to go to church. I used to go to church when I was young, consistently. I used to go to Crusaders on a Tuesday. I used to go Pathfinders on a Wednesday. I used to go Bible studies on a Friday. I used to go Sunday school on a Sunday. And yeah, back to Crusaders again on a Tuesday. So I was a church boy. My family was kind of poor. We didn't have much money. So when the summertime come, I wasn't getting a holiday to Spain or to Mallorca, or holiday to Turkey, Istanbul. I was going to Cornwall with my church, because we were broke. So my mum didn't have no money to send us. I didn't even go to Jamaica. It was just like, yeah, the church will take you on holiday. You pay six pounds and you get a holiday. Now, it wasn't cool to be broke. It's not cool to not have no money. Like so much so, when I used to go back to school after the summer holidays, and people used to say, what did you do in the summer? do in the summer and I hear people say oh, I went to Antigua oh, I went to the Bahamas I didn't want to say I went Cornwall with the church so I used to lie I never used to lie I used to twist it and say I went Penzance which is in Cornwall but it was just a word that sounds nice and it sounds like it's far away so I used to go yeah I went Penzance and that's because I didn't want no one to make fun of me because we were broke and we didn't do nothing great and who likes to be broke who likes to be broke not to have money no one. Why do we not want to be broke? We want to have the finer things in life, right? We want to have those nice things because this is what people respect you for. This is what people rate you for. And what we do is, when we're young, I was talking about this the other day in Stockholm, what we do when we're young is we look up to people. And that's where we get our inspiration from. Like some of the girls might look up to uh, uh, Beyonce. And be like, and I'm not saying it's a bad, but you might be like, look at her, like she's got a good family, she's married, she's got this, she's got that, she's got everything, she's beautiful, I want to be like her, as boys. So we get our role models from those people on TV that look like they're living a great life. Some of the guys might look at some of these rappers or superstars on TV and be like, look, this guy's got this, he's got that. He drives this car, this is the brand clothes he wears. And you want to be like them because it looks like they live this great, successful life. But this is normal. Maybe our parents don't understand that, but I do. This is normal. This is the norm. I was just like it when I was young. I'm not saying I'm not young no more. I'm still young, but yeah, when I was younger. I used to look up to the rappers. I remember Jay-Z. I didn't, listen, I didn't look up to Hassan Ibn Thabit when I was young. I didn't know who he was. I'll be honest. But he's a great poet. He's a great poet, he's one of the poets, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's poets, and he used to make poetry all about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like praising him, showing his love for him, and he was a great poet, he's one of the companions, he's a Sahaba. But I didn't know about him when I was growing up, because no one wasn't talking about him like he was the cool guy. I didn't see him on my TV, I didn't learn none of his lyrics. I used to turn on TV, MTV, and I used to see Jay-Z. This is the reality. Because this is the world I was living in. This is the world I was raised in. I used to see Jay-Z. I used to see Jim Jones, Joel Santana. These people, they was rapping about money, cars, girls. I'm watching Jay-Z and he's like, we got Ferraris and Jaguars switching four lanes. 
Top down screaming out money ain't a thing, hey! And he's throwing money up in the air and he's got girls sitting on the back of the convertible Ferrari doing that in their bikini. And then uh, Jermaine Dupree's driving in the other one, I think they're in south of France. And he's like, hey, balling. And I'm watching these videos as a youngster. Broke, can't even afford a pair of Nike Air Max. Thinking, Ferrari, Jaguar, switching four lanes, top down, hey, uh, I want to be just like that when I'm older. Of course, that's what I want to be like. They're living the high life. They're going back to this big mansion with a swimming pool. This is what I wanted to live like. This is where I get my inspiration from. And if I didn't get my motivation and inspiration from them, I would get it from the people I used to see in my area then. And who did I used to see in my area who was making money and who was the cool guys? It was the ones doing criminal activities. It's the drug dealers. It's the fraudsters. It's the criminals, the robbers, the thieves. They come around in a big Mercedes, big jewellery, nice watches. The women was attracted to them. Why? Because they, they saw security there or something. Oh, yeah, he could buy me shoes, he could buy me a bag, he could take me on a holiday, he could take me to eat at nice restaurants. They were attracted to him. They weren't attracted to the boys like us who was just broke in our house playing computer all day. They wanted that, that guy. so this is the guy we wanted to be like. This is where we got our motivation from. I didn't know about no Sahabas. I didn't know about none of these people. They were not my role models when I was growing up. My role models was the rap stars. The superstars, the athletes, the footballers. This is who I wanted to be like. This is the reality. Because they look, seemed like they was living a great life. Now, what happens is, is you realise the older you get, reality kicks in. And you have to take time out to question this life. To question your purpose. To question your existence. The beginning of our life is okay, it's ignorance. We don't know what we're living for, we're young. It's ignorance. We don't know why we're here. We're just here, the world is like a playground to us. We just want to have fun. We just want to be happy. But what we're guilty of is this. We're victims of searching for happiness in all the wrong areas. We actually don't know what's good for us. It's true, Allah did create us. We are property of Allah. Allah created us and Allah knows what's good for us. We don't know what's good for us. We think we know what will make us happy. So we spend every day of our life chasing our desires. Chasing our desires, thinking, yeah, I'm going to do that because that will make me happy. I'm going to wear this because this will make me happy. But we still end up sad. None of us are happy. None of us are content. So we're all chasing happiness in the wrong areas. I like this girl because she's like that. I like that guy because he's like that. The things we think we want, the things we think are good for us, ain't actually good for us. There's shaitan. This is the trick of the shaitan. What he does is, he decorates those things that are bad for you to make them seem like they're amazing and they're beautiful so that we're attracted to them. And you see the things that are good for you and that you need in this life. He makes them look boring and unattractive so you don't want it. You know, it's like food. It's like food. You know a salad. Imagine an advert about a salad. It's just green. It don't look nice, but then an advert for Burger King or something, or McDonald's, they know how to make that burger look so juicy. The cheese, the sauce, the burger, the bun, and it just looks amazing. But that's not good for you. But the salad is, and look how boring it is. But that's Islam. Islam is like that green salad. It just looks boring to us. <laughs> us as kids, Islam just looks boring. It just is like a green salad. But the truth is, that Islam is actually what's good for us. And everything we want, that happiness we want, that contentment we want in our heart is in Islam, is in that salad. That nutrition is all in Islam. It just doesn't look appealing from the outside looking in. But from the inside looking out, you know it's amazing. Because the truth is, I went straight for that burger. That's what I went for. Ah, I want that money, I want those girls, I want those cars. I went straight for it, head first. And that's how I was living. That's exactly how I was living. I had it. By 17, I remember going in JD Sports, R6, Yamaha R6 motorbike, pulling, upside, pulling up outside, taking off my helmet, going in the shop, chatting up the girl that's working there, serving me. Yeah, I'll have those in a size 7. Let me get two pairs, please. Showing off to her. Then, uh, let me get your number as well, please. 
This is what we do. Sure enough, yeah, she must want me to give it. Look, she saw the big motorbike outside. She saw I'm buying two pairs of trainers, different colours. She knows I've got money. Come on. She likes this. That's how you feel. That's how you feel. And then I was doing all of that. And I was going to parties. And when as soon as I get to the party, everyone knows who I am. I'm going on the mic. I'm doing my thing on the mic. And you feel like, yeah, 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 I'm the man. I'm the man. And everyone might look at you like, yeah, he's living a good life. But the truth is, you're not content. And I'm talking about it on a small scale. But I toured with Mutabil Napoleon. He's talking on a big scale. This guy was with Tupac. He tell you the same thing. He say it does not bring happiness. It don't bring contentment. I toured with Loon. Amir. Amir Muhaddif. He, 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 he was doing the same thing. He was with P. Diddy and that. And he'll tell you the same thing. It does not bring you contentment. It doesn't bring you happiness. I was just on a small scale in London. Doing my thing in Brixton and stuff. But however, it's exactly the same thing. We do not find happiness and we do not find contentment. These guys are just coming to the stage today to tell you don't run towards a life we're running away from. You're fortunate. You're blessed with something from birth. From birth, your parents actually gave you names like Muhammad, like Abdul Aziz, like Omar ibn Khattab. Your parents gave you those names from when you was born, like Fatima, like Khadija, like Aisha. You got those names from young. And then they actually gave you instructions on how to live. Like they tried to give you a bit of guidance. Go to learn Quran. Come pray. See the guy, dad's praying and your baby's jumping on their dad's back. They're seeing that from young. You don't understand how much we wish, we wish our parents were on that. Do you know what we was going through in our houses? In, in our households, what our mums and dads was teaching us. I used to have to go to the, I used to have to go to the window, answer the window and say, what do you want? Oh, he wants such and such and such. Mom, he said he wants this. Yeah, get off the top of the fridge. Illegal substances, serving it for your parents. From nine years old, ten years old. Here, take the money. Mom, where should I put the money? Pull it in the drawer. Open the drawer, yeah. You just made a sale and you're only ten years old. This is what we're learning. So, when we get to this age of 18, 19, we come out of these years of ignorance. Because you can't be ignorant forever. This is the truth. We can't stay ignorant forever. Alhamdulillah, we managed to live past our youth and we've gone to, through puberty and we've become young adults. Now it's time to wake up when we're young adults. It's okay when you're young, okay? If you die at 13, 14, 12, 11, Allah, Allah, you, maybe you get straight to Jannah because you're still young. You're still in your childhood. You didn't have that free will yet. But you see, once we've gone past puberty and we're now young adults, it's upon us to question ourselves what is the purpose of my life why am i here what am i doing with my life what am i living for what am i living for now this is it and we all want happiness so how do we find this happiness now it's about really questioning ourselves so it's time for the ignorance to go and Allah is so merciful what will happen is an event will take place in our life that will force us to to think like this maybe some, one of your friends would die maybe you have an argument with someone in your family or a loss takes place. Something happens, always. And it makes you think, do you know what? I need to fix up. What's the purpose of my life? I need to fix up. An event takes place. And when that event takes place, you start searching for the truth. This is what happened to me. So I was 18 years old. I'm in the studio. We go there to play computer. Playing FIFA. Smoking. I'm on next. Bam, bam, bam. Music's playing, we're writing lyrics and songs. And then the same guy I used to look up to, he comes into the studio, haven't seen him for about three years. This is that street guy who was the big man. He comes in the studio and he's like, ah, turn the music down. And then he leaves. And we're thinking, why is he saying turn the music down? Like, doesn't he want to come in, talk with us? He comes back. And now to cut a long story short, he keeps doing this. I'm thinking, yo, what's happened to your big brother? Because the guy who I started my studio business with is the younger brother to that guy that was the coolest guy in our area. He used to ride the motorbike, he used to have all the money. He was the younger brother. So I was like, what's happened to your older brother? He's changed. He's not the same as how he used to be. And the truth is, he spent some time in Turkey. He ended up converting to Islam. And I was like, Muslim? Black Muslim? 
Ain't that for Asians and Arab people? What kind of madness has corrupted his head to become a Muslim? I thought your brother's gone mad. Now he's wearing dresses. Your brother's lost it. Guy used to have a gold chain and a motorbike. Now he's in a dress. So he used to come in the room and speak to us. And this is the truth. To us, before, we didn't know about Islam. We actually did think it was just for Arabs and Asians or if you asked me when I was in school, what is Islam? I'd have said, is that a country near Pakistan or something? We don't know, we're ignorant. But when I see him and he come in the room now, he started telling me about Islam, he started giving us dawah. And he's saying like, what's your purpose of life? What are you living for? Why are you here? Where'd you come from? Why are you here? Where are you going after you die? For me as a youngster, I'll be honest, the fact that I couldn't answer these questions hurt me, pained me regardless. Because let's just be honest, we know a lot of things. We know why we come here today. We know why we go to the shop. We know why we do everything. How can we not know our purpose of life? Really and truly, how could I not know that? He's saying you know so much, but you don't know what you're living for. I'm not a loser. I don't like to feel like an idiot at any point. But at that moment, I kind of felt like an idiot. I don't even know. He said you come from a God, a creator. Yeah? And you are here, this is the way he broke it down, to impress that God, that creator. Because after you die... You're going to return to that God, that creator, and you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged. Everything you do now in this world, in this life, will be written down by the angels. Yet, the angels are following us all around. And everything we do is being noted down. Everything we do in public, everything we do in secret, everything we reveal, everything we conceal is noted down. And that will be in our books, and our books will be handed to us. After we die, we'll be judged. We'll be accountable for everything. So your purpose of this life is to spend your time, every minute of your days, doing the things that are pleasing to that God, that creator, that made you. Because after you die, you're going to return to that God, that creator, and he's going to judge you. Now I'm sitting there in the studio, thinking about my life. And how I spend my time and what I do with my days. Have a think yourselves right now. You can think about your days and your time because you know what you do in secret and what you do in public. You know what we do. You know. It's, it's different what you show your friends. You know what your life's like. And let's imagine we was to die today. How would we be judged? So this was worrying for me. This was scary for me. This was super scary. So I'm thinking, wow. If I die today, my judgment, I'm finished. All the things I do with my time, I'm just a bad boy. <laughs> I'm finished. Like, I'm, I'm absolutely finished. And I believed in God. I believed there was a God because I didn't need no, no convincing there's a God because I just have to look at the human body. I have to look at these hands, these eyelashes, everything about the human body. And I know, there's, of course, there's a God. I have to look outside, see nature. And I know there's a God. You don't have to give me dawa. You don't have to prove it to me with no science that there's a God. I know there's a God. I'm not stupid. Of course there's a God. But the more we spoke about this religion, this Islam, is the more I was interested. And I've, I decided to go to the bookshop with him. I started reading books about Islam. And the more I was reading, it's like I was like, wow, this religion, why did they not tell me about it in the first place? This is deep. So eventually I felt like I want to become a Muslim. Because what a Muslim is, is one who surrenders themselves to God. And I believed I should surrender myself to God because God made me and that's where I came from. So I wanted to become a Muslim. But the truth is, I was scared to become a Muslim. Because I spoke to someone else, another friend of mine who was black and he became a Muslim. And I told him about my decision. I was like, bro, I'm thinking of becoming a Muslim as well. And he was like, yeah. You think that's easy? You're going to have to stop all this rapping business you're doing, you know? I was like, what? How can rapping be wrong? Like, I just won't, I won't rap about badness no more. I won't rap about guns and drugs. 
I would just rap about good stuff. He's like, nah, nah, nah. The rap, whole music industry, bruv, is bad. You've got to forget that. And slowly but surely, he started breaking down to me that everything was haram. He's like, yeah, you can't go to these clubs no more, these discos, these nightclubs. I was like, bro, I'll just go there to listen to music then. I won't go there to drink no alcohol. And he goes, bro, it's not just the alcohol that's haram, the music's haram, the whole club's haram. I was like, what? It's all right, cool, I'll just go out with friends when it's my mate's birthday or something. He's like, birthday? That's haram as well, bro. I was like, what? I says, all right, cool, we'll just go to the coffee shop, like me, couple girls, couple guys, we'll just go coffee shop, play cards and chill. He's like, what girls, bruv? You can't free mix like that. That's haram as well. So I said, bro, what kind of a religion is this? What am I supposed to do with my life? How am I going to spend my days and my time? Everything's haram. I didn't understand. And then, so for me, I'm 19 years old. My desires are crazy. How can you tell me this is what the religion's like and expect me to follow it? This is going to be way too hard. This is my habit. This is what I'm used to. This is how I live. I'm from London. It's the fast life. Oxford Street, every day. Women, men, we're crossing through each other. Hi, what are you saying? You're right. We go to school. We, go, we do things together. This is our life. This is how we are. Every shop we go into, there's music playing. I heard that new tune, the radio in my car. I listen to it. It helps me on my journey. You're telling me a religion that's going to change everything. This is too hard. I can't be a Muslim. So I wanted to be a Muslim, but I can't. I'm going to become a Muslim when I'm about 45, 50 years old. That's why, I, that's the way I saw it. Why not? Like, I have to. It's too hard to do that right now. But then I went back to the first guy I was talking to. And he was like, who told you? Who was giving you all this dawah, bro? This is the problem with Islam. Everyone wants to give dawah. But there's a technique to give da'wah. There's wisdom we have to use. We need knowledge and wisdom and beautiful character. You can't just see someone and be like, I stuff for Allah. Where's your hijab, man? You need to, like, this wisdom and knowledge, you have to know how to speak. You have to know how to speak. What did Aisha say? If, we, if they came to us with the rules straight away, we would have all ran away. May Allah be pleased with her. He said, first we learnt faith. So you have to build up your faith first. And once the faith is at a certain level, the iman is there, the taqwa is there, the fear, the faith, and the understanding of that religion is there. Then you start to fall in love. And then once you fall in love, then you want to do more. Well, that's when they listen and obey with no option. When they told the believing women to cover their, they was ripping their cloaks and putting it over their head. Because they had so much faith now. It's like a man and a woman meeting out in the street. And a man says to the woman, hey, just met for the first time. Why don't you come to my house and do X, Y, Z with me? She didn't look at him and say, no, are you crazy? She might even slap him in the face. But let's imagine they meet. Parents allow them to have meeting after meeting after meeting. They get to know each other. They get married. They do in the car. They spend six, seven, eight months together. They fall in love with each other. Then he sees her in the street and he's like, hey, babe, why don't we go to the house and do X, Y, Z? She's going to say, yeah, come, let's go. And it's the same two people. But the reactions, and it's the same question, but the reaction is different. What's the difference? The difference now is they now know each other. And they now have this love for each other once they know each other. So therefore, it's the same with this, this relationship with Allah in a sense where if I say to someone, do this, do that, and they don't know Allah well, of course they're going to find it hard to follow those rules. But once they start studying and they start getting to know Allah and they get to know their religion, their faith increases, they fall in love with this religion. And all the rules they'd want to follow. So the guy said to me, listen, you need to take your shahada now if you believe. You need to become a Muslim now. Because the worst Muslim is better than the best non-Muslim. At least you're trying. That's the main thing. Try. Take steps. Start praying. Try your best. That's the best you can do. So I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, if you're going to still sin, still sin. But try. Start praying. And this is what a lot of people don't do. They think that I'm too bad. I can't pray. I'm too bad. I sin too much. No, no, no. You need to pray even more then because you're so bad. You need to pray. You know, some people wouldn't come to the events. Like, no, I don't want to go to that event in the masjid because I'm so bad. Everyone's going to judge me when I go there. They're going to be like, ah, oh, look at this, look at that. You're the one who needs to be at the event even more. We're going to welcome you more with open arms. If you come to our events in London and big up my brother Abu Bakr Islam, we've got this site called Roadside to Islam. Check it out. Roadside to Islam dot com. We attract, if you come to our events, do you think the manners are like this? You'll have boys saying, oh, hey, bruv, that's my seat. I'll punch you in your face if you don't move out. These are Muslims. The manners are bad because they're on the streets. 
They're bad. They're Muslims, but they're, they're still bad boys. The sisters, hijab, they're cussing each other. Come outside, I'll fight you right now. This is how they are, even though they're Muslims. And, and we was embarrassed once. We was like, whoa, whoa, this is crazy. Like, and one of the shit speakers that we got there, he said, no, this is beautiful. How did you manage to get these street thug Muslims to come to an Islamic event? This is amazing. So you should be coming to these events. Don't ever be scared. So anyway, I took my shahada. I took my shahada and I wanted to build up my faith slowly and start praying slowly. And this is the main thing. I was still rapping, still rapping. I was still doing criminal activities. But you know what? The fact that I was going to a study circle every Saturday night was helping me. Because I'll go to that study circle and I will learn something. Then the next day I'll be with my friends and I'll feel like this ain't right. Because of what I learned the night before. So this is why we need to consistently be learning. This is how we can improve. So then slowly but surely, the more I was going to these study circles and the more I was praying five times a day, I never neglected the prayer. Because the prayer I'm asking Allah to guide me, guide me to the straight path, the path which you have favoured, not the path of those who earn your anger or those who go astray. Guide me Allah, please. He's going to guide you if you're asking him with a sincere heart every day, five times a day. And how much times do we repeat it when we pray? He's going to guide us. So slowly I felt that guidance until it got to a stage where I'm going to the study circle on a Saturday night. Then the next night I'm at my friend's house in the studio and I'm listening to everyone swearing and cussing each other. And it feels too impure for me. It just doesn't feel right anymore. So slowly I stopped going. It happens naturally. We don't have to force these changes. As long as we study and we seek knowledge, it will happen naturally. If you're a brother and you want to learn how to do this better, it will happen naturally if you start seeking knowledge. If you're a sister and you want to start maybe wearing the scarf or you want to become better, it will happen naturally if you start seeking knowledge, you start going to study circles, you start praying. Naturally, you won't have to force it. It will naturally happen. Because Allah guides those who he wills. Allah will guide you. Hidayah is from Allah. The guidance is from Allah. So naturally, I started to get better until it got to a day where music I love so much, I actually said to the other guys in the group, I don't think I can stand up in a club again and rap. I just don't think I can do it. I don't physically think I could go in the club and rap. I just don't think I can do it. It's not that I want to quit. I just can't do that no more. With what knowledge I have in my head, I don't feel like I can stand in that environment no more. And they understood, but it was hard. And we have to make sacrifices because I was getting called back. I went to get, I'll wrap up my story like this on my shahada, but I went to get lessons. I went to a masjid big like this. I said, I need to get lessons, man. I need to be better. So I was doing lessons. I went to a masjid. I saw the imam who was leading the prayer. And I said to him when he was walking out, I said, Salaam alaikum. I said, can you teach me? I want to learn. I'm a new Muslim. I want to learn Quran. I don't understand it. I want to learn Arabic. He said, come, come with me. He was Egyptian. Took me in his office. He said, come here, Wednesday and Sunday, six o'clock. We do lessons. Don't be late. I was like, yes. Something to make me feel better. I can start learning now. He said, I can start improving. So I started going to his classes. And you know what happens? Shaitan tests us. Don't think we're not going to be tested. Shaitan tests those who he... Allah tests those who he loves. Sorry. Shaitan. Allah tests those who he loves. He tests you. And I was tested. So I'm going to my classes now. I'm driving there. I'm playing my Quran. Mashir Rashid al Fasi, Juz Amma, trying to learn it. Yep, I'm focused. I'm getting on my deen. Driving to my class. I get tested. Stop off to pray. Ah, gotta pray. Stop off in Streatham to pray. I come out of the mosque. I'm wearing a white folk. Everyone can see this boy has changed. He's changed. Ashley, that used to be on the streets the other day. He's Muslim now. Look at his white folk. I'm running back to the car after the prayer to get back in the car to drive to my class. I see a girl. This girl, I used to like her. I used to like this girl. But I haven't seen her. She was never interested in me. All of a sudden, ah, oh, Ashley, big hug. I'm like, yo, can't you see I'm in a gown? I'm, I'm a bit, this is a bit awkward for me. This is a bit awkward. I'm like, hi, you are right? And then she let go. I'm like, hi, yeah, you are right? She's like, what you been up to? What's your number? I'm like, ah. Oh. She never used to see me like this before. Can't you see the Muslim gown I'm wearing? This is tests. Tests will come your way. So anyway, I got through that one, got back in the car, <clears throat> stay focused, driving to my class, listening to my Quran, doing well, come on, phone call, yo, what are you doing? I said, oh, yeah, I'm just going to my class, 
Are you listening to the radio? No, 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 I'm not. Why? Put the radio on now. They're playing one of your songs. Put the radio on. <sighs> Test again. Turn off the Quran. Put the radio on. They're playing one of my rap songs and she's talking about me. This is a great rapper from, da -da 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 -da, from South London. This is great song. We hope to hear more music from him soon. I'm like, ah, oh, I might need to go back to the studio. <laughs> you see the, see the test? So then I get to my class and I'm distracted. The teacher's like, Bilal, okay. And I'm just like, yeah, 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 yeah. My head is thinking about the girl, thinking about the radio. My head's all over the place. These are the tests that's going to happen to us. And my teacher could see it. So my teacher said to me, you've got too much distractions. Do you know what you need to do? Why don't you go to Egypt? This is where I'm from. I'm from Egypt. Go there. And that way you will study in Egypt, Quran, Arabic. And when you leave your class, you go to your, house, your flat and you practice it. You go to the market, you practice what you're learning. Too much distractions for you here in London. Your past life is knocking at your door every day. You're going to fail. And this is it. We have to make sacrifices. I had to pack my bag and I had to fly there. And within a week I was out there and I stopped rapping. I stopped all the music. Alhamdulillah, it helped me. In Egypt, music wasn't a fitness no more. In London, it's hard. Put on the radio. In Egypt, it's like, yeah, Habibi. That ain't going to affect me. I'm not interested in all that. So I come back from Egypt and Alhamdulillah, I felt better. I'm still tested to this day. Sometimes I sit on the stage and they're like, ah, but people might ask me, I was in Canada recently and a brother was like, how can I become like you? I said, why do you want to become like me? You want to become like the Sahabas, like them. You don't want to become like me. I'm just like you. Even the great Imam says, don't follow us because like we, we could say one thing today and tomorrow we go back on it. I'm imperfect just like you. So it's not about being like me. My journey continues until I go to the grave. I will continue to be tested. So this ain't my journey from the streets to Islam. And now it's done. And I'm cool now. And you lot need to try and be cool as well. No, we're all in this together. And it's a constant battle until we reach the graves. And what we need to do is we need to assist each other. It's not about pointing fingers at each other. Like, yep, she's doing that. He's doing this. Have you heard about that one? It's about opening our palms and helping each other. Yeah, you're doing some sins, bro. Do you need any help? I assist, if you need any help, I'm here. It's not about, ah, oh, did you see what he done? We need to help each other. So when I came back from Egypt now, a brother said to me, it's Eid day. There's a lot of people in the masjid, a lot of shabab, a lot of youth. Do you want to do some rapping for them? I'm looking at this imam like, yo, I used to be ashamed to come to the mosque because I was a rapper. Now you're telling me to rap in the mosque. He said, no, without no music, like poetry. So they had to pull my arm to do this. I was like, ah, oh, no, I don't want to do it. I don't, because I didn't want to do this. This isn't something I chose to do. I want to be a Muslim rapper or a Muslim poet. It's not a career path cho choice for me. Yeah, I want to be Muslim Bilal. That's my stage name. I want to tour and I want everyone to know who I am. No, this is, not the, this is not what it is at all. When I became a Muslim, it was walking away from the limelight. It wasn't walking towards the limelight. It's like, yeah, let me chill now and just be a Muslim. But I was requested to do this. And then when I've done it once, okay, I'll do it. Someone else said, look, can you do it again? Can you do it here? Can you do it here? Until, alhamdulillah, I found myself in Sweden now, doing it. So, that poetry, what I've done, and it went well. I thought someone was going to say, stag for Allah, he's rapping in the mosque, and walk out. I thought, but instead, the brother came up to me at the end, and he was like, mashallah, it's very good. Do you have this on CD? So, to end with, I'm just going to do one thing for the sisters. I made that. I made it, I went down well in Malaysia. This is a small thing because, like, obviously the brothers can relate to my lifestyle because maybe you lot are going through the same thing I'm going through. Uh, my sister put something on Facebook. I just want to say this so you know that it's not judging no one or anything about the way she looks or dress. And a brother attacked her straight away. She took it and he said, Sister, fair Allah, you shouldn't be wearing all that makeup and your eyebrows shouldn't be like this. And da -da -da -da. he just went in on her. And she defended herself. Well, you brothers shouldn't be busy looking at those girls who dress like this and da -da -da, maybe wouldn't feel so ugly and feel like we need to do this. Da -da -da. And I was just watching the argument and the debate. It's like, ah, okay. But I never get involved. But one thing I did notice is that the girls thought that they, they're definitely more attracted to anyone who dresses. Like they're more attractive. The more revealing they are is the more attractive they are. That's what they think. Like them, and I was thinking, no, that's not, that's not, the, that's not, that's not, like, men like their, like, she was like a pearl, precious, like, and covered, like, that's what they like. So I made up this thing, 
And if you're not covered and all that, it's not no sort of attack whatsoever. Not so ever, because we're all coming from somewhere, like I understand, didn't it? But I made this up just to boost the morale, to let them know what we're attracted to anyway. It goes, uh, Bismillah. Sister, I can't even see your face. Sister, I can't even hear your voice. Sister, I can't even smell your scent. You must be the one I last sent. Pious sister, we can't even see your face. Sister, we can't even hear your voice. Sister, we can't even smell your scent. You must be the ones the last sent. Pious sister. She's walking in a black veil, talking in a low voice. She ain't got no smell. She don't want to see no boys. She's embarrassed when she's out there in the public. Her beauty is amazing, but she don't want it public. She wears flats cause the hills bring attention. She must be the one my books used to mention. And she don't wear makeup, she's HD Claire. And her eyebrows haven't been threaded in a year. She got a head full of knowledge and a heart full of fear. Eyes full of love and her hands full of care. Loose are the garments that she likes to wear. She could have a good body but she prevents the stares. I like the way she gets all embarrassed when I recite a verse. I like the way she wears a rabbiya with the converse. And she don't let him go to sleep stressful. But she don't want to get cursed by the angels. Sister, I don't even see your face. Sister, I don't even hear your voice. Sister, I don't even smell your scent. You must be the one who lost scent. Pious sister. And I want to tie the knot like a boy scout. You know what I'm talking about. Complete half my dean and I'll be walking out. With my queen, my wife, and she's veiled up, covered from head to toe. That's how I like mine veiled up. That's mine, brothers, that's not for your eyes. I only want that one wife to follow God's way of life and die. Would like to give her about 17 children, 10 boys, 7 girls, and feed all of them. And I'm going to raise all my boys to be soldiers, my girls to be wives. I'm not following my oldest, not. Nah. I want to live in a household of love. When daddy comes home, little girls run and give a hug. When it's time to pray, replace all the rugs and the mats and call the whole family to come and pray salat. Brothers stand at the front, sisters stand at the back. Whole family praying together, now how real is that? After the prayer, recite Quran, taking in turns that we could talk about school today. What did you learn? The young kids go and play, my wife's cooking some food. With the oldest of my daughters in there helping too. With the oldest of my sons outside with me, up on the roof, going through some Quran and hadiths and football. <laughs> I'm just trying to paint the st structure, the picture, the family structure. With Islam in my life, it's so much better. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for having me. Khalas, salamu alaikum. Follow me on Twitter. Keep updated. Keep updated. Roadside to Islam.com, Street or Dean. These are websites you can stay um, updated. And I'm Ashley Balao Chin and Chin Ashley on Instagram. Yo, salamu alaikum.